Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd, I'd like to say I hope you enjoyed your lunch, but I noticed that a large number of you actually joined the uh, the media session as well. We'll talk a little bit about the, the future of what's going on with the CEA. So I'll hand the stage to you. Thank you very much, Sir Stephen. Mark, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction and good afternoon, everyone. And it's an absolute pleasure to be able to uh, speak to you this afternoon at the BBGA uh, conference. Uh, as Mark has just discovered, uh, then I did take the opportunity just to listen in to a number of the previous uh, presentations. I found them hugely fascinating uh, and it's really helped in what uh, my primary goal uh, uh, when I'm in the CAA is to uh, engage and to understand, uh, to understand what's going on across all of the parts of the aerospace enterprise uh, to ensure that I can do my role to the utmost and that I can help uh, guide the CAA uh, appropriately. Uh, I was delighted to hear the uh, the chair this morning in her introductory remarks saying that the BBGA has a strong relationship uh, with the CEAA. Um, delighted to hear it um, and I want to do all that I can to reinforce that relationship and keep building it into the, uh, the future. In terms of just a little bit of background, um, I'm not going to go through my sort of uh, CV, uh, but uh, I do uh, claim, um, carefully claim, uh, some background in business aviation. Uh, and the reason I say that is that uh, in my previous roles, I ran a fleet of 10 business jets uh, transporting VIPs, VVIPs around the world in some interesting places. Um, they tended to be high profile and demanding customers, um, but more importantly, perhaps, uh, what it really reinforced with me is in uh, meeting their needs. It was the need for flexibility, it was the need for rapid uh, response, it was the need for a reliable response and a reliable service. So, I, you know, I get that part of the enterprise. Um, also within my previous remit was RAF Northolt, and as a number of you will be aware, then RAF Northolt uh, does uh, have a significant amount of uh, business aviation traffic as well. So as I say, I'm not claiming in any way to be uh, an expert. Uh, I wasn't running a business, um, but I think that I do have at least some uh, insight into uh, some of the uh, experiences and the work that, uh, that you do. So in the sort of 20 minutes or so, then what I want to do is uh, talk about just um, some personal uh, principles and priorities which inform how I'm approaching my role in the CAA. Uh, yes, as uh, Mark touched on, I've been doing it now for seven or eight months, but nevertheless, these are my key principles and priorities. Uh, I, I apologize to a degree if you've heard, some of you have heard them before, um, but I think in this area, it's uh, a bit of judicious repetition is perhaps uh, necessary. Uh, I'll then move on to uh, talk about some headline issues and needless to say I'm going to talk about COVID and EU withdrawal as those two headline issues. Uh, there's much more going on besides, I'll touch very briefly on them later on, uh, but uh, happy to, to follow up in uh, Q&A afterwards if necessary. And then the final part of my, uh, my words uh, at the start will be just looking at that uh, CAA of the, uh, the future. Uh, and the title that's uh, up on the screen there is A Positive Future from Our Regulator. Uh, and yes, I do feel positive about our future. You know, I've been involved in the aerospace enterprise one way or the other through, uh, throughout my life. Um, I, uh, I take pride in that and I really look forward uh, to its bright future as we recover from uh, the current crisis. And then we'll move into the uh, the Q&A and uh, in the Q&A, then uh, if the questions get really difficult, then uh, David Kendrick and Sophie O'Sullivan should also be uh, on the line and they can uh, help me out um, as, a, as necessary. So first then, um, my personal uh, principles and priorities for the CAA. Uh, three general principles, first of all, uh, it's independence, leadership and, and inclusivity. For independence, what I mean by that is that, you know, it's in the very essence of the CAA as a regulator that we must be uh, impartial. Uh, it, by being impartial, by treating everybody uh, evenly, um, predictably, um, giving certainty where we can, we can, that's how we retain uh, the respect, trust and confidence, which is absolutely implicit in our, our role. But in that in independence, uh, I don't see that independence as in any way implying remoteness. I don't want us to be a remote uh, regulator. We're not a remote regulator. We are engaged with those that we regulate, developing our understanding to ensure that, uh, that what we do is as effective as possible. That second principle then of uh, leadership, 
what I'm not claiming here is somehow the CAA uh, leads the entire aerospace enterprise. Um, you know, it's not our role. Uh, I don't think anybody could actually uh, lead such a, a diverse uh, set of activities. Um, and, uh, and we don't have the authorities to do that. But what I do mean by leadership for the CAA is um, we have to be an exemplar of the values that we want to see across the aerospace enterprise. Uh, we want to lead things like the, uh, the just uh, culture. It's also leadership in terms of uh, creating the environment uh, for others' uh, successes, um, a key tenant of uh, leadership. And it's leadership also in relation to our uh, convening power. Whilst we might not have authorities necessarily in a number of areas, uh, then what we can act is um, a, a point of bringing people together uh, and getting the right conversations going and getting to the right uh, outcomes. So that's what I mean by uh, CEA in a leadership role. And finally, in terms of inclusivity, now this is inclusivity in uh, its very broadest sense. I want uh, us to be a, a CAA for all. It is a diverse enterprise. There are so many sectors within it. There are so many individuals uh, within it. Uh, I want us to be seen as, uh, as working for everybody in an even and predictable, even-handed way. Um, that means without bias, but I should say that if we do have uh, one inherent bias, uh, it's actually to consumers, is ensuring that they are appropriately represented in this and that their interests are looked after, whether that's in relation to safety, security, or their uh, consumer rights. In terms of that inclusivity, uh, that implies, again, engagement and communication across the enterprise. It also implies that we need to ensure that we have as diverse uh, an enterprise as possible, that we are properly representative of those who we serve um, and that, that there is equal access uh, to all. So those are my three sort of general principles, but I also have a further three principles which uh, sit within that, which are my personal principles as a regulator. And I emphasize it's personal. These you won't find uh, necessarily written down uh, within the CAA, but it's what's in my mind and that's what I, I hope you will find uh, useful. The first of those personal principles is that um, safety is ultimately not delivered by the CAA. Clearly, we have a vital role to, uh, to play in creating the right environment, creating the right regulatory environment, uh, assuring that uh, we are as safe an enterprise as possible. But safety is primarily delivered by those who are conducting the activity. I very firmly believe that, and I know you will too. The second um, uh, point is uh, in relation to delegation, because it follow one follows from the other. If safety is primarily, primarily delivered by those conducting the activity, then we need to ensure that we delegate to the maximum practical extent to those who are conducting that activity, because they are closest uh, to, uh, to the activity. Now, that doesn't mean delegation come what may. Um, it doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, we somehow delegate and, and forget about it. We clearly have that assurance role. And so delegation has to be properly earned. Um, it has to be done in a properly uh, balanced uh, way. Um, and uh, we need to, as I say, uh, make sure that, uh, that things are actually happening as they, uh, they should do. Now, I'm sure that uh, many of you will probably come back to me and say, well, um, how does that delegation fit in uh, with, uh, with your lived experience? Well, those are exactly the sort of things that, uh, that I think we ought to have discussions about. So I look forward to that. And the final personal principle I have as a regulator is that um, you know, we are an authority. It's in the name. Um, but our authority is best exercised um, by not um, dealing in an authoritative way on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we uh, will use that authority proportionally and we'll use it with uh, discretion. I'm firmly of the belief, and this pretty much fits into my leadership views as well, is that um, uh, our job is uh, not to tell people what to do, it is to create the environment in which people do the right thing because that's what they want to do not because we somehow just you know, try and regulate them to that, uh, that position. So th those are some general principles and hopefully they'll just give an insight into what's in my mind as I, uh, as I tackle my uh, current role. 
The final bit of this uh, first section then is just to talk about my personal priorities to the CAA. And uh, these I've said widely, uh, to be honest, I actually said them throughout the selection process as well. Um, but they're the sort of touchstones, if you like, uh, as, I, uh, as I do my work day to day. The first thing is I want the CAA to continue to be a world class uh, air and uh, shortly, uh, I expect, a space regulator. Uh, I want us to be uh, leading in the delivering safety, and security and safeguarding the consumer interests and that we have the trust and confidence of all of our stakeholders. And that's from those that we regulate through to consumers, government, uh, internationally, all ranges of stakeholders, we want to have that trust and confidence. The second uh, priority that I have is uh, we need to be able to respond to this changing environment. I mean, it's one of those, uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm sure that anybody has said throughout the history of the aerospace enterprise is that, you know, this is a decisive moment and uh, we need to be prepared for the future. Well, you know, I'm going to say it again, um, and I think I can probably say it with greater confidence than people might have said in the past, just given the situation that we're in at the moment with this greatest challenge crisis that aviation has ever um, had to uh, respond to. But we have to, to be, need to be able to respond to the changing environment, be it COVID, be it the broader messages it tells us about uh, resilience. Um, but we also need to be able to deal with those other fundamental challenges foremost of which is about sustainability and decarbonisation. You know, this is the biggest strategic issue that we have to get to grips with, because if we don't, uh, then we don't have a secure future. But we also need to think about sort of uh, innovation and uh, new technologies. Uh, we need to uh, talk about airspace, modernisation, all of those sort of issues um, are in play, and I'll touch on some more of them uh, later. But it is that ability to respond to a changing environment to be a flexible, adaptable, forward-looking organization. That's what the CAA needs to achieve. And therefore, the third priority, and these are not in order, um, but the third priority is uh, to ensure that the CAA continues to have excellent people who have got the right capabilities and experience uh, working within an organization which has the right values and cultures to deliver not just the day-to-day, but to be able to respond to that changing environment and to continue enjoying the trust and confidence uh, of, uh, of everybody. Now, um, you know, I've frequently said, and it's one of those uh, perhaps obvious points, but worth re uh, reiterating, the, the CA doesn't actually own anything. It doesn't own aircraft, buildings to a degree, I guess, but the only thing that we own is our, the intellectual capital of our people. Um, and I'm absolutely clear that uh, it is our strength now, uh, and I need to make sure it continues to be our strength uh, into the future. So that's the first section then um, of uh, principles and priorities. Let me move on then to talk about the uh, the headline uh, issues. Now, I so I've listened into some of the conversation already uh, today, so I'm going to try to just abridge my comments. So I don't uh, repeat what has already been said. But the first aspect I want to look at is uh, COVID um, and just talk a little bit um, about uh, the CAA's uh, response. In terms of that CAA response, perhaps the most important thing to start with is to say, um, you know, how do we ensure that we understand properly the crisis and properly understand the challenges which uh, everybody is, uh, is going through? Um, because we don't want, as I mentioned earlier, to be some remote uh, regulator. We need to understand what's going on. So we put a lot of effort um, through either engaging uh, individually with entities or engaging with associations or however it might be, but making sure that we understand uh, the crisis properly and the challenges that are faced. Allied to that, therefore, is we've um, tried to provide as much support as we can practically provide across uh, the, uh, the sector. Now, there's clearly a differentiation here, and we've got the aviation minister uh, later. Um, uh, there's the role of government and there's the role of CAA. And we can talk about that um, uh, if you wish. But in the, within the authorities and the responsibilities and the influence that the CAA can provide, we have been very active in trying to provide support uh, across the enterprise. 
The next point I'll just sort of say, and again, uh, perhaps obvious, and uh, you will all know this as well as I do, is that uh, just because the volumes of uh, air traffic are suppressed, that doesn't mean there's been any let up in activity, um, either in sort of making sure that the remaining activity is conducted uh, as well as it uh, should be, or indeed with dealing with the business consequence. So this has been an exceptionally uh, busy period. Um, uh, you know, and I was amused uh, the other day that somebody sent me a message, a friend um, not related to aviation who said, well, you must be looking forward to aviation getting back going and uh, getting on with uh, with doing the job uh, as if somehow, you know, um, the, uh, the CAA had been in a fallow period. It hasn't been like that. Uh, and, I, you know, I have to give a shout out to the team in the CAA who in the working environment that we're all experiencing at the moment, uh, working remotely, uh, have just done a, a superb job and really stepped up to the other uh, plate. In terms of what that support has meant in uh, in practice, then it's been a you know things like extensions, exemptions, and alleviations. Um, that's part of understanding what uh, what we've been doing. Uh, the only cautionary note, as you would expect, is uh, let me say this won't this environment won't last forever, um, and there is catching up uh, to do. Particularly, we're focused on on-site uh, visits. Um, we you know, want to ensure that we properly got our finger on the pulse and we understand exactly what the state of the enterprise is. Uh, and you can do so much remotely, but a lot of it has got to be done uh, face to, uh, to face. Um, what we've also been looking at throughout the pandemic is also considering uh, novel approvals. Um, there's been a lot more activity on RPAS, for example, and that is not only in response to the immediate crisis, but starts to provide a little bit of um, an insight into where we might go uh, in the future. We've also been dealing with dangerous goods, and I very much uh, took the point earlier on of the role business aviation has played in uh, providing essential uh, supplies. Um, my point in mentioning this is that, uh, again, I think it has shown the CAA at its best in a number of areas is where uh, a new situation has, has arisen where we need to respond quickly and effectively uh, and we're doing it and we need to make sure that uh, we carry that forward into all of our work. Um, and we've also been busy uh, on with consumers and uh, consumer refunds has clearly been uh, the most prominent uh, issue in that. Um, uh, actually, I think we've got a good story to tell, um, certainly in comparison to uh, a number of other nations. But nevertheless, um, quite rightly, um, we're all judged by those areas where it hasn't worked so well. Um, and I'm very clear that we need to investigate all the means to ensure that we're better able to protect consumers in this uh, particular area um, in the future. I mean, consumers to a degree may understand why it was a real challenge uh, in relation to our response to the pandemic. What they will find rightly more difficult to understand is if we don't recognize that that was the situation and adapt to what we do uh, in the future. The final bit I just uh, say in relation to the CAA response is um, uh, I just was very grateful for the comments that were made uh, earlier on um, by a couple of uh, the earlier speakers uh, just saying positive experience with the CAA, fantastic support, um, very helpful. Um, actually, those, those comments mean a lot to people who are working uh, really hard uh, and I will pass them, uh, them on. I'm not saying in any way we're perfect. We are always a learning organization and trying to uh, to improve. Um, but where things have gone, gone well, I really do appreciate that, that positive response. So thank you for that. Turning on to uh, restart and recovery risks from, uh, from COVID. Um, let me just give you my sort of headline picture of uh, where we're at. Uh, if I'd roll the clock back six, nine months, uh, we would have been expecting to be um, well up that um, trajectory of recovery um, and looking forward to a, a pretty good summer. Uh, clearly, it didn't turn out that way. And actually, we're now at uh, overall, I appreciate the differences across sectors, but overall at a uh, the lowest ebb that, uh, that we have been. And that low ebb, um, has been sustained now for quite a considerable uh, length of time. That in itself clearly causes us uh, concern from a CAA perspective. I know it will cause you concern as well. Um, uh, allied to that is we can now see you know, endpoints starting to get closer, 
not least in relation to uh, the success of the vaccine program and a potentially pretty steep angle of recovery, steeper than what we were previously expecting. So you combine that sort of like lower ebb with a steeper uh, uh, recovery uh, and there's a lot to, uh, to get to grips with there. In relation to that, we are doing work, and I'll uh, touch on that uh, in a moment, um, but a key part of that will be what I would call indicators and warnings. What is it that we might see um, across all aspects of aviation, which would tell us that some of those uh, risks were starting to materialise? Um, now, that's not in any way to say that these risks are uh, manageable. I'm confident that we will continue to have a very safe enterprise, but we all share a collective responsibility of ensuring that we um, regulate and calibrate our way uh, back to where we were before. So in terms of mitigating those risks, what, what, what are we doing in the CAA is, um, well, uh, I would say we're taking safety leadership here. I think that's part of the, our leadership uh, function. We're not responsible for delivering it all, as I mentioned earlier on, um, but there's a leadership and a convening role. Uh, we've created a cross CAA uh, team working with uh, industry, trying to make sure that a recovery, the recovery is safe, secure, and looks after the consumer. So it's working across all aspects of, uh, of, our, uh, of our remit. Um, you can expect to hear much more from uh, that team and the work that we're doing uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Probably the most prominent issues, though, um, uh, as you'll be well aware and discussed early, relate actually to public health. Uh, and we need to be careful here is that uh, whilst the CEA has a role, actually a increasing role uh, greater than we had before in enforcing some of those public health issues in relation to testing, passenger locator uh, forms, etc. Um, we don't actually own those as regulations. Uh, they are owned by other public health uh, bodies. Uh, and that's created some interesting sort of uh, tensions within the, uh, within the system. And the final part is just to uh, emphasize that uh, coherent and coordinated a way. We're also working very hard with um, bodies such as ICAO to ensure that we're joined up internationally, because unless we do it internationally, then uh, we're, uh, we're really not going uh, to take things forward in the way that we wish. Right, let me move on then to uh, about leaving the EU and uh, leaving e EASA. Um, I, I think this has actually been uh, covered pretty well already by the DFT and, uh, and, and David Kendrick's presentation earlier. But let me, so let me just sort of go through them reasonably uh, briefly. Uh, the first one is in relation to, uh, to market access. Um, and uh, clearly there is that challenge of a, an overall agreement um, reached at the end of December, which uh, did not go down into the detail uh, and has required us from a, um, you know, with little uh, timelines available to us uh, to then engage with 27 states to try and uh, persuade them uh, to give a block permit for UK uh, carriers. I think there's been great work being done. Um, it is just going to take time and, and quite often as was touched on earlier, those timelines aren't owned by us. Uh, we're reliant on, uh, on other nations. Um, but that market access and that reciprocity word, I absolutely understand the concern. Um, I'll just assure you that we absolutely understand it um, and we're doing all that we can uh, to progress things forward. The next issue is, uh, is going to be in relation to uh, alignment and uh, absolutely uh, recognize that we need to uh, remain uh, aligned as much as possible because to not do so creates cost and creates complexity. Um, but equally, there's opportunities to be had here um, that we, when we're not in uh, EASA and we need to take those opportunities as well. So it's getting that balance is don't diverge just for divergence sake, recognize that there could be consequences, but equally take opportunities where they uh, exist as well. And we need to engage and consult widely to make sure that we've got the right picture uh, there. Um, so uh, that's, I uh, think, uh, let, let me just, um, uh, you know, conclude at that point because it's already been covered but uh, say it will take time there is politics involved there are national uh, issues involved the key is that we stay engaged 
Um, and uh, I do sense, and I know that uh, my team in the CAA sense, is that um, dealing with these issues has actually brought us closer together, um, particularly with the BBGA, um, because um, you know it's allowed us to understand and work through things quickly. So I just underline that point uh, that was made several times earlier on, is don't hide the problems for, from us, tell us the problems, uh, don't assume uh, that there won't be the cut. There won't be an answer. Um, perhaps there is an answer, and it really, in many ways, it's through practical examples that we will be able to um, uh, flush out the general principle and get us to the position that we want to be. Final point, just to say on this though, is that overall um, the uh, approach here from the CEA, uh, working with government where appropriate, is that we are not trying to, if you like, reduce down to be uh, we're just in the UK um, and take a narrow UK perspective. We want to grow our international relationships. Um, that's with the EASA. Uh, it's also the bilaterally. It's also in relation to ICAO. It's all across all of those sort of areas. Uh, we're actually putting a lot of effort into ensuring that we're not seen as a sort of narrowly based uh, nation. We want to be expansive and we want to be uh, out there to the greatest extent possible. So um, finally, then, uh, let me touch on uh, defining the EAA of the, uh, the future. And uh, again, as the chair said uh, right at the start of today's session, is that we're all working towards a better future. And uh, that's absolutely where I see it from a CAA perspective. All the challenges that I've mentioned, or the, both the challenges that I've mentioned, are in there. Sustainability I've touched on already. Airspace modernization. Um, you know, yes, it might feel it's gone a bit on the back burner, but it is fundamental to so many aspects of what we do, including sustainability, that we need to bring that back up the agenda pretty uh, quickly. Uh, we need to look at consumer interests and expectations. There's rising expectations from consumers, and I welcome that. You know, why wouldn't we want consumers who constantly are striving uh, and demanding of us better uh, standards and better access? We want to look at the future regulatory environment. i uh, touched a degree on that already, um, but, uh, but overall we want to get to a position where um, we uh, have the regulatory environment, which is not just the, if you like, uh, based on that repository of knowledge we've had from decades of experience, but is one that is fit for us uh, going, uh, going forward. Um, I uh, was impressed in a number of ways to find out recently that there are 40,000 pages to the CAA's regulatory environment at the moment. Um, that creates challenges to go through all of that, but it also gives a bit of an indication of, you know, what's in my mind about how we might uh, get to uh, the future. I've spoken about innovation and new technologies. Um, there are a number of sectors uh, who um, have actually thrived uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, ARPAS is one of them. Uh, space is um, uh, an increasing uh, focus for us as well. And new technologies overall, I want to make sure that we create the re right regulatory environment um, for the uh, exploitation, development and exploitation of new technologies without compromising our regulatory role, if you like. Um, I don't want us to be the dragging anchor in any way, is that new technology is available, but we've got a long you know, uh, like regulatory approval process, uh, which time is that innovation. And we want to look at areas like the next generation of people in the aerospace enterprise. We want to look at the development of STEM skills, uh, etc. And I know that's going to be covered later on. Bring all that together then is what I want is um, this coherent strategy, which defines the CAA of the, uh, the future. It's um, not letting go of the day job. You know, we absolutely know what needs to be done right now. And that's what keep, is keeping us busy, busiest. But like any decent organization, decent business, we're also trying to chart that course uh, into the, uh, the future. Within that strategy, it's not just a series of you know, actions, if you like. Um, it's uh, that, 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 that describes what we do. But what we're also working on is how we do it. Um, how we make sure we've got the values, the cultures, the engagement, etc., uh, in order to deliver that uh, that future. And the final point is that uh, in that uh, strategy, it will it recognises that duality of our functions is that yes, we have that core regulatory role, uh, and that is you know something that we will absolutely protect. Um, but we also have a related but separable role which is enabling and shaping the future of the aerospace enterprise. And I want to make sure that we are doing that successfully as well. 
So that's it. I hope that's given an insight into where I'm coming from in terms of principles and priorities, the things keeping us busy at the moment, busiest at the moment, which is day job, COVID, EU withdrawal, um, and giving you an insight into defining our future. Most of important of all, though, to be successful, I come back to what I started with. Uh, we are only successful if we are engaged, building our understanding and communicating. Uh, and I give you my personal pledge that I will do all that I can uh, to promote that uh, while I'm chair of the CAA. Today, this session has been a valuable part of that. So thank you very much indeed for the opportunity. Mark, back to you. Thank you, Sir Stephen. Much appreciated. We've got some, uh, some questions coming up on the side. Before I pose those to you, um, just something, the Global Task Force for people who don't understand that um, is actually all encompassing for transport. So it does include marine road haulage, trains and aviation. Um, and we're fortunate enough that the DFT teams and yourselves have co-opted us into that so that we do have a voice in that process. But that's the trick. We've got to get solutions that will actually deal with all of those multimodal aspects. So not, not necessarily easy. First, a nice easy question for you here. Um, this is EGNOS. And should we have a transition plan to deal with this for the UK? <laughs> So um, I, I'm well aware of the uh, uh, the issue uh, at the headline. I don't claim to be uh, an expert in all of the detail, but I'm well aware of the uh, the issue. Um, uh, this, I think, falls into one of those categories that I mentioned of we understand uh, the issue, um, but is not uh, solely in our control to uh, to deal with. Um, there are significant politics involved, uh, and there's the government position uh, as well. Um, I understand uh, the challenges that um, uh, not having that uh, assured signal can cause. Uh, we will do whatever we can to highlight what those challenges are, what the potential alternatives uh, might be, or what the potential options might be. Um, but ultimately, I can't make you promises um, of something that um, I, I don't actually um, uh, control. But we've definitely got that uh, that issue in sight and having all the right uh, conversations. Um, all, all I would ask in response to that question, is there a particular angle that you the, the, the questioner would like to ask uh, of me? to uh, recognize British licenses? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the simple answer would, well, you'd have to ask Yasa um, uh, in, uh, in that respect. Um, what, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to my, uh, my, my experts in, uh, in, in a moment, and uh, David uh, or Sophie might want to, uh, to come in. Um, I say I can't control what IASA uh, do. What I want to uh, ensure is that there is mutual recognition to the greatest extent uh, possible. Um, uh, I, I've no, I, I don't feel that anybody is trying to make things difficult in that re uh, respect. Um, but uh, nevertheless, there are you know other uh, agendas in in play. Um, so. Um, you know, David, do you want to uh, to come in? Can you bring David into the other uh, conversation here? We're just working on that in the background, and here comes David. Uh, the wonderful technology. Forgive me if I try to turn the camera. Thank you for that. Um, yes, very much. So, conversations are taking place with the gas and now, as you would expect. Um, getting past the end of the transition period has actually made life considerably easier in that respect in that regard because the ask can actually now formally talk to us politics got in the way before there are discussions going on now about the creation of a baza which uh, is a bilateral aviation security and safety agreement and that is very much key to what we want to do in this regard we are looking at licenses we're looking across the piece what we can actually do to get mutual recognition thanks right. david thank you um Another angle on a question here, does the CA have a role in um, protecting smaller airfields and helping smaller airfields in the UK? 
So, I mean, we um, uh, we don't have um, you know direct authority in uh, in that uh, that area. But what we do recognise is that if we are properly going to enable the uh, aviation in the UK, then uh, you know, airfields clearly are a, a vital part uh, of that. Uh, and I think we've all uh, seen over the last uh, several decades uh, that steady decline in the number of uh, airfields you know, across the uh, across the piece. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, it's an issue of concern is that we, we won't have a thriving uh, industry or enterprise unless we um, have the right airfields. Uh, governments recognise this as well. And uh, we uh, are fully engaged with the Department for Transport uh, and having the right conversations uh, at the moment uh, about how we will you know, ensure this going forward. So it's easy to talk about it in principle, but essentially you need to have um, uh, a, a developed plan which says which airfields um, do we feel are vital ground? Uh, what, how, what will our response be if there is a proposal to close an airfield uh, which we feel um, does not uh, support the uh, the enterprise? I say we, we don't have authority in our in an, our own right to say you can't close an airfield, um, but um, uh, we need to ensure that the right conversations are being had. And I say we're in, uh, very much involved with that uh, with the DFT at the moment. DFT will clearly need to work uh, across government because the thing is we're all aware, well aware. Um, closure of airfields uh, is also closely tied into other government priorities. Um, there's not, uh, for things like housing, it's not that the government's setting out to um, uh, you know, close airfields, it's about uh, looking for land for other purposes as well. So government's got a, a balance that it has to, uh, to draw there. But you know, going back to the top is that um, uh, there is definitely something here. Um, uh, if we're going to have a thriving aerospace enterprise in the UK, um, we're going to have to have the fixed assets to ensure that that, uh, that happens. That also spreads uh, to a degree into the um, wider safety considerations, which we're interested uh, in as well. Uh, if we have an ever fewer uh, number of airfields concentrated in a smaller number of areas, then it increases congestion um, and that uh, might cause us a concern as well. So we're looking at it from a number of angles. Uh, that, that's appropriate. I, I think there's another angle to this, just to make you to aware. There's uh, there's certainly been a report going round that there's been support in Germany, for example, 20 million euros through this year to actually help develop small airfields. So that that's a, a nice level playing field for the for the UK. But, but there are some positive moves being made to actually get a good infrastructure that we can learn lessons from and our colleagues in DFT can, can look at and see. So yeah. that's a bit of the background to that question, I think. I'm having a, a look over to the side here and I'll ask a, um, a last question here. Oh, this is a nice technical one. Excuse me for leaning over. How is feedback managed from very different operators? And is there anything that you would like to see change to improve its effectiveness? How do you cope with the breadth of responsibility and enforcement issues. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very broad, uh, broad question. Um, I, I mean, I would, I, I guess, answer it uh, or respond to it by saying that um, it's about ensuring that we have the, um, the most effective network um, to uh, to inform us. Um, we get. You know, a lot of um, correspondence coming to us by uh, by various means, and some of it will come to me uh, directly. Um, you know, because my email address isn't hard to figure out, um, and that will come from you know associations. It will come from entities that we regulate. It will come from individuals. Um, uh, some of it is uh, supportive, uh, some of it, you know, is, is critical of us. And the way that I approach those is that, well, um, we have to be a listening organisation. Uh, um, if we're exemplifying the just culture, then we have to um, uh, be a learning organisation as well. So all of those sources of information, uh, we need to look through and say, OK, what does this say? Um, is there, what's the issue here? 
Um, are we doing the best we can to uh, to support uh, that individual or that uh, entity? Is there something that we can learn and do we need to change? Um, and so we're not precious about it. We're not defensive about it. Uh, we want to ensure that we do uh, do our best. There is a reality, uh, though, um, and it's one that uh, you know has certainly been reinforced uh, to me over the last sort of seven or eight months. Is that um, firstly you, you don't necessarily make everybody happy, um, and um, frankly, that's not the regulator's role. The regulator's role is to do the right thing uh, and to do it in a consistent, predictable, um, and informed way based on uh, evidence. Um, that doesn't necessarily make you popular with everybody um, if you know the decisions uh, go go against. Um, the second thing is that, um, uh, and I guess related into that, is that it is can be quite difficult to consult and to understand well what is you know the the the, the overall sense to get gain here because on any given issue um, there is such a range of perspectives. Uh, and it's very hard to ensure that you are talking to the right representative of the, the that sector uh, uh, as, as a whole. Um, because I've, I've certainly found that, um, you know, somebody says, well, where did you get that information from? So, well, we talked to that association uh, and somebody could well respond to us. They do respond to us and say, well, they don't understand themselves what's going on. You know, here is the truth of what's going on, and so trying to reconcile all of those various uh, inputs is a uh, is a real challenge. Now, it's not a plea for sympathy. Um, you know, this is our job um, uh, to uh, to work it through. Um, uh, we can only be effective if we are informed uh, and understand. So, I want people to engage with us. I want people to raise uh, raise issues. Um, you know, if it's helpful, again, uh, you know, David, if, do, do you want to come in and say what it feels like at the uh, the coal face in that respect, in terms of ensuring uh, how we are properly informed and how we deal with um, uh, things which are uh, which come our way? Very kind, thank you. We, we've ha tried hard, Mark, through your association and others, to provide a lot of conduit, particularly in the build up to exit over the last two or three years. So we've created a number of uh, avenues to come to speak to us. We proactively arranged business forums across all the sectors so that we can actually gather views and take them away. It, it's been quite interesting, the spectrum of views that we actually may get in one particular meeting. But one of the things that we are keen to ensure is that everybody actually has a voice. We may not agree with it. We may not be in a position to actually take it forward, but we listen to everybody with respect and we take it to the wider group within the authority so that we can actually come up with a collective view. As Steve, as Stephen said, sometimes it not, may not be a position that elements of the uh, of the industry can support us upon. However, nation, it's probably a message to to people here today. Um, that by getting that information into an association and making sure that point is res registered so that, that we can give a one voice approach rather than having lots and lots of, of broken noise in the background, I'm sure our regulator would appreciate that. Uh, that's not making sure we don't listen to everybody, but, but if we can try and coordinate our activities, I think it will just help the process work a, a lot better for all concerned. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, and, you know, the point is that there is that we're not trying to, you know, as you're not trying to is, you know, snuff out the individual voices, but just to understand, you know, is there an aggregate issue here um, or is there an individual issue is just really important because it affects how we, 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 we deal with it. So, you know, knowing that broader context, I think, is really important. Right. I can see we have questions on the side, but we're running out of, of time. We will take those questions and make sure they get posed after the uh, the event. The other thing I'm conscious of is a lot of people didn't have a break because they, they got occupied with a media session over lunch. So we're going to call a, a break before we have our next session with the aviation minister, give you a chance to have a comfort break 
and a quick bite to eat, I'm sure. Um, and then we'll rejoin again. And I'm just checking my diary. So in theory, we should be back at 13.50, which is not a lot of a break. So um, look, thank you very much, sir, Stephen, and the rest of the CAA team. Really appreciated the time you spent to come to us. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everybody.